Uh, this is our, our last Sunday in kind of the Who You Are series that we've been doing. And this, uh, who you are is, is you. So it's not the church, the church building. Uh, it's a very cool building, but it's talking about you, the people. So the, the ecclesia of the church, which is the gathering, the assembly of people. And that, that's who you are. And then there's some characteristics about who you are that make you guys so great and wonderful and special. And so that's what we're talking about. I want to start out today by asking a question for you. Um, okay. I want you to ask, <laughs> let's have more fun with this. If you're, here, if you're here by yourself, welcome. I want you to answer this question for yourself. If you're here with a partner or a friend or a spouse um, or somebody like that, if you're here with somebody, I want you to answer the question for them or on their behalf. So would you consider yourself to be, or are you bold, brave, or courageous? That's, that's the thing to think about here. Are you bold, are you brave, or are you courageous? You know, the... The, the guys are like, yeah, you know, I'm bold, I'm brave, I'm courageous. Many of us know that our, our wives are way braver uh, than, than we are here. So I've actually got, here's the litmus test for this. Here's how we know. We just jump right into the, the scripture here on this. So God makes it very simple for you to figure out whether or not you're bold, brave, or courageous. And the way that you can do that, the way, a surefire way to know, you know, kind of outlined by God, outlined by his design of us and his design of the world that we live in. Here it is here. So you may want to write this down and get ready for this. But, but are you bold, brave, or courageous? The way that you know is who kills the spider on the ceiling. Okay? Yeah? He thought I was going to give you like a verse or something. But who kills the spider on the ceiling? You can pretend to be bold all day long or courageous all day long. But when that big rain spider, like the size of your hand you know, comes down the ceiling and starts coming down the, the wall, you know, it's, okay, who's going to, who in the family or, or who are you going to call in order to uh, take care of that spider there? There's three categories of people. The person that kills the spider, you are bold, you're brave, you're courageous. The person that runs away, you're smart, okay? <laughs> and the person that catches it to re-release it or to just catch it, well, you're, you're crazy, okay? <laughs> So those are kind of the three categories, and, and I, so I thought this would be kind of a funny way to kind of quickly like tie into life a, a little bit, because, um, you know, if I were to make a metaphor with the spider, uh, some of us go through life and we think that we're bold, we think we're brave or courageous, or we're trying to be, and then all of a sudden life throws a spider on your wall, and it's usually through like one of three areas, the, these kind of trigger points. Uh, it's usually through like a relationship or it's through a situation or it's through a like a responsibility that you have. And so you'll encounter one of those three that will kind of act like a like a trigger. And that's like the spider on the wall where you think I was feeling bold and courageous. But now there's this this spider here. And it's, on the, and it's on the wall, and I all of a sudden don't feel that way. When I moved to South Africa, uh, I moved from Tennessee and moved to Nelspreet, of all places. And I was running an NGO that worked in communities out there. And I remember that the, the first night, so I lived on this beautiful, amazing farm uh, with this amazing, like, Afrikaans family, like the, the kind that doesn't speak English. And they had... I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, fruit trees and like a, a, a warble named Booty and, you know, just like everything that you would think there. And they had a, a house on the property that was a little two-bedroom house that they let me live in that I rented from them. So it was the main house and then there was my place. Now, I moved in February. Um, I moved in, and moved into this little house and Nelspritt was just like exploding, you know, with green and and wet and water and all that stuff. And I remember the first night that I was laying there in bed because they had just told me that no one had lived in there for like a year and that they'd gone through and kind of swept it out and cleaned it up a bit. I remember the first night I'm laying there in bed and I'm just like afraid to move because in my mind there's just, I'd already seen like four of those big rain spiders, you know, on the walls. And I was like, I'm not going to live through this night, okay? <laughs> I felt pretty bold and courageous selling everything I owned and moving to, you know, to Africa. But then that night, I was very humbled. I was not bold. I was not courageous. There were definitely spiders on the ceiling there. But this isn't 
This isn't God's design for our life. And it's not that you should ever struggle with not feeling bold and courageous, because that's just life. We're always going to encounter that, always going to have problems with that. But God's design is not that we're afraid of the, of the spiders that are life, or it's not that we stay afraid of those things. In fact, God gives us the opposite encouragement. In Deuteronomy 31.6 here, this is the Israelites are, are, are getting ready to go into the promised land, but they're afraid because the giants are, are living there. They go and they see these giant people, and so they're worried about it. They're concerned. They, they don't think it's possible. And, you know, they're, they're told, be strong and courageous. Okay, don't be afraid of the spider on the wall. Be strong, be courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble in dread before them. And the them that it's talking about are the giants, the people that they would have to go and take over the city. So it's not like they're going to show up and hang out together and have a cup of coffee. You know, They're going to go in and slaughter and kill everybody and take the land for themselves. That's what God's like, hey, don't be afraid to do that, even though they're all much bigger than you are. For, and here's why. This is why he says to be strong and courageous. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you and he will not abandon you. So that's a beautiful promise that he gives us. And and I'm careful to take something in the Old Testament and then to apply it to us today because I don't want to like misuse scripture. Like we're not going to take David and Goliath and say, you know, who's the Goliath in your life? Go and fight your Goliath, because that, that's not necessarily what the story is. is. That's me inferring a whole lot. And I don't want to infer a lot with this here out of context, but here's the context that we can take from this. This is the heart of God, that the promise that God gave for His people when Christ died on the cross, that promise extended beyond the Jews and into the Gentiles and into us today. So the heart of God, the promise of God, is this statement here that God is saying. God is saying to you, to all of us, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble in dread before them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you and he will not abandon you. That should be the motivation for us to live this incredibly courageous life. So I would like for us to consider today what life would be like if we made a shift and a change in us that we were going to be bold and courageous. What would that be like? You know, you would probably be able to, I mean, you would carry yourself differently. So many of us even hold a posture. And I know this because this is me. Hold this posture of like shrinking back, you know, because you're so... Uh, like you don't believe in yourself, you know, you struggle with self-doubt or, or, you know, you've always kind of, you know, let me just kind of sink back here. And you you even have like a posture around you about it. So, I mean, if you live this bold, this courageous life, yes, there's still be things that you could be afraid of, but even just the way that you walk and you present yourself, you know, can be, you know, like uh, shoulders back and open. But that that's just even in your posture, it could even go further than that. I mean, just imagine if you adapt what we're going to talk about, this, this courageousness. If you walk into every situation in your life and you're able to say, I know that God is with me and that he will not fail me and he will not abandon me. So I'm going to be strong and courageous. That should be an easy promise for us. We should hear this and then we should be able to say, absolutely, done. Because if he could take the Israelites... And, and take that promise for them and extend it all the way to us. I mean, we're here today because of this promise. You sit here in this building amongst this gathering, this assembly of people, because of this promise. If God is able to send Jesus, who's able to die on the cross, and then be dead for three days, resurrect, and then go up and ascend to heaven and commission the church to be born, and then mankind, as much as we mess everything up, we've not been able to ourselves kill the church it is surviving us in spite of ourselves if all that is possible then surely I can choose to be strong and courageous in my day-to-day situations but we don't we 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 honestly we struggle with it now I would like for us to learn to do this today and I feel like the the place that we need to start is in our prayer life being strong and courageous in our prayer life Being strong and courageous in the way that we talk to God in our petitions and the things that we ask God for. Now, I think that there's some categories amongst us. I'm going to give you four categories that kind of that will keep us from becoming strong and courageous. 
And I, and I, want, I think everybody will identify with some of these. The first one is this. Are, are we not courageous because we are comfortable? Is that the reason why you're not bold and courageous? You have everything that you need. You're comfortable where you are. Uh, you're good with what you have. Like Life's pretty good. Life's pretty comfortable. You know, I'm, I'm happy. I don't really need to be courageous about anything, especially about your prayer life. You know, something happens, uh, or, you know, let, let's say somebody comes to you and says, hey, can you pray for me? Uh, I've lost my job. I don't have any money. We don't have, you know, any food on the table. And you may be moved by that, but I, I don't know that that keeps you awake at night. Maybe it does, but maybe it doesn't, or probably it does. At least for me, it doesn't always do that, because I'm comfortable. So I have what I need. I, I, okay, I, I've got food on the table. We're okay. And so what we do is we send like a WhatsApp, you know, hey, everybody, pray for, you know, pray, pray for Chris and Casey. They're broke. The church doesn't pay them any money. You know, one of their cars is broken down. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We're fine. But you send out the messages. Hey, everybody, let's pray for this person. And then you get a bunch of like these, you know, you get your prayer hands, you get your thumbs ups on there, you get your hearts on there. I believe there's a step of courageous and boldness beyond an emoji. And the emoji is not bad. Continue to do that. But I believe that there's something more. But, but maybe it's being comfortable that stops us from going that extra step. If it's not being comfortable, maybe it's being content. You know, we, we can become content with what we have. And I, I, contentment for me is a, okay, it, it can be a good thing. I'm happy with what God's given me. I don't need more things. That's not the kind of contentment that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about with contentment is almost like complacency. You know, when you become complacent with life, when you become complacent, you, there's no need to be courageous. Because you're like, uh, you know, again, I've got everything that I need. I'm okay. You know where the hardest place um, is I'll, I'll show you this when we got ready to move to Cape Town we were up on the mountain we were praying over the city of Cape Town I was up there and I was saying God show us where you want us to be in here and 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 I I had heard from God that we were to move here and we were to to lead a church but I just was like God wouldn't it be super cool if you just showed me a, like a vision like a just something that I could see that you're confirming or you're you're calling it and when I prayed that I got this vision of, uh, of two God's hands coming down from heaven and dragging across the southern suburbs and picking people up and then dropping them into a church. And out of this church, there was a, a light that was coming down from heaven, not, not going up, but there was a light that was coming down. And God, was, God told me, if you, if you build a church that, that honors me, that I'm happy with, I'll, I'll fill it with people. It's a really simple statement there. But what, here's, here's the interesting thing, or the cool thing, is I'm on the mountain, I'm looking down at the southern suburbs. Do you know where, it was on my, the right side, so it would be God's left hand. Do you know where God's left hand was dragging from? It was dragging from the top of Bishop's Court. Okay, I've never forgotten about those people that are up there. It's amazing, wonderful, incredible people that Jesus died on the cross for. But it's also the hardest area to witness or take the gospel into because not all of them, there are great people there, but not all of them, but a lot of them are comfortable, they're content. They don't need courageous prayer. And we don't want to pray courageously for people that are comfortable and content because we call it, oh, okay, we're being cautious. So maybe we're not courageous because we're, we're cautious. You know, I, I don't want to believe in something that's impossible. I don't want to take a step towards something that, that is impossible. Let me just be cautious here. You know, let me be really careful about this. I don't want to pray for healing for this person because I want to be cautious because what if we pray for it and then it doesn't come or it doesn't happen? Okay, let me just, let me be really cautious here. Here's the thing about caution. Caution has a, li has a time limit. Caution can begin, but there's a point where caution ends and action and decisions begin. But when you take away the end point of caution and you allow your whole life to be wrapped around this cautiousness, then, then it's really difficult. In fact, you will not take on a bold and courageous life of prayer, a bold and courageous life. Caution has got to end. 
And then decisions have got to start. Decisions have got to begin. Now, this, this last one that I have, maybe you can identify with. It's got a strong word in it here. But are we not courageous because we are cowards? Is it because we're cowards? And I, I use that word. It's a bit different from fear. And you're going to see this word's in Scripture. This is not me just, you know, trying to get on to you guys. This, is in, this word's in the verse that we're going to look at here in just a second. See, fear is being afraid. You know, I'm afraid of the dark or I'm, I'm fearful that, you know, um, I'm going to get hurt or, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of whatever. But to be a coward, it, it's, it's saying I, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to take a step out in faith. I, I, a coward is like an, it's like an identity. Fear is like an emotion. To be a coward is like an identity of who that you are. And when you take on this identity, this bold, courageous life, this bold, courageous prayer life can have no, no feet. It can have no way to gain momentum, no way to move forward. So let me show you before you get upset that I've called, you know, potentially called you a coward, you know, which is, again, it's a strong word, but some of you are cowards. When you know that something needs to be changed, spoken against, corrected, that boundaries need to be put in place, that you need to look at the guy or the lady in the mirror and say, I'm going to stop looking at this and I'm going to hate it. Or I'm going to stop hating it. Instead, I'm going to do something to change it. When you, when you know that that needs to happen and you don't do it, it's because you may be, maybe, is because you're a coward. Because you've let fear sit in your life for so long that now it's taken on a personality, it's taken on a characteristic of you. And Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Here it is in the Bible. Here it is in the Scripture. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear. That, it, didn't, it's, it didn't come from God. And that means that it's not God's plan or God's will for your life. Do we want to live in something, controlled by something, that's not God's plan or not God's will for your life? Because if we feel like God is a good, good father and he takes care of us, then we don't live in this, but instead he's given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, which these are abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. This is what God has for us. This is what can feed the bold and courageous prayer life that he has for you. Power of love, a power of sound judgment, personal discipline. That's God's design for you and that's God's design for us. But let me give you some encouragement here with this here. Okay, so let's look at this first part. I love this. Uh, this is something that Casey and I started doing years and years and years ago because otherwise the weight of our complicated lives as things were happening and we were going through tough times was so crushingly heavy that we said we got to change the way that we look at things right here. So for God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear. So those things don't come from God, but watch how we can do this. <laughs> this is, this is going to change your life, or I hope that it will. Okay, so I want you to think about everything that could cause you uh, timidity, to be timid, to be fearful, or, or the spirit of cowardice. I want you to think about all those things, all right? You should actually be able to make a list, okay? Here's what I'm afraid of. Here's what I, I feel like I've taken on this personality of, of cowardice, and I don't want to change what I know needs to be changed. Uh, here's what I'm really timid about. And I want you to write all those things down in a list. In fact, I want you to take the next two weeks and every time something new pops up, I want you to pull out your phone, open your notepad and add it to the list there. Now, this is not going to be a list of everything that's wrong with you. And, and well, it is. It is a list of everything that's wrong with you, but that's not where it's going to end. This is not a list to make you feel bad about yourself or to make you feel horrible. It, that's not the purpose of it. See, what, what, here's what Satan would love to do. He, he, does, he tries to do this with me all the time. Satan would love to say, okay, Chris, 
Chris is doing pretty good. He's got a few days of momentum. Things are good happening at home and family and church. And then all of a sudden, something pops into my head. You know, like the, sometimes or a lot of times it's related to anxiety. You know, you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden, like poof, you've got every conversation you've ever had with somebody uh, where you said something dumb. And then all of a sudden you remember all of them and you think about it, you know. Or you're taking a shower, uh, getting ready for, I mean, these are my, my, these are my situations. Taking a shower, just getting ready to start the day. All of a sudden, you know, poof, you remember that dumb thing that you said you know, like a month and a half ago, and then you start to feel insecure about it. Or you're having like a, a ever, anyone ever have a shower argument? That's the best place to win arguments <laughs> because the other person isn't there. So you're washing your hair and you're like, you know, and you're like, I'm going to win this argument here. That's why some of you are bald, because you argue too much in the, in the <laughs> I don't think it works that way. But I want you to think about these things here, because what Satan would love to do is Satan would love to say, like, okay, I can knock Chris, I can cut him down at his knees anytime I want to. He may think that he's doing well or leading well or being a good dad or a good, a good husband, but anytime I want to, I can just cut him down. Because I know what his weaknesses are. I know what he's afraid of. I know what he's timid about. And I know those dark places in his heart, those things in his soul where he still struggles with being a coward. And I can cut him down anytime I want to. That's what what the deceiver wants you to believe. Now, when I make out my list, what Casey and I started doing a long time ago is flipping this on the deceiver. And instead, when I look at that list of everything that I'm fearful and timid and cowardice about, I say, huh, this is an amazing list. I love that I have this list. Do you know why? Because everything on this list is an opportunity that I get to need Jesus more. And so thanks, Satan. Thanks, deceiver. You know, fist bump. You the man. Thanks for, thanks for reminding me everywhere where I get the opportunity to need Jesus more. You know, this is something that we took on as we looked at how do we deal with hard things that happen in our life. And we just chose to be thankful. God, thank you so much that you wanted to get my attention because you know that my life would be better with you in it in more ways and in deeper ways. Praise God for that. And so over the next two weeks, when you create your list, when you write all that down... You're going to look at that list at the end of two weeks. You're going to say, this is incredible. Look where I get to need God more. And then you're going to pray a prayer that I'm going to teach you at the end here, which is going to help embolden you and empower you and equip you to look at that list of things and say, like, this is amazing that I get to need you more, God. And then here's my prayer to combat with the deceiver, what Satan would try and get me to do. And when you do that with the things that that you're timid or cowardice or fear about, when you do that, then you flip the script completely. You take out the ability for Satan to come and just cut you down at the knees. Because everything that comes on your life, you get to say, thanks God, I get the chance to need you more in this. And that is a bold and courageous life. To be able to look at your hardships and your hard times and to say to yourself, there is nothing that can come my way that does not drive me towards a bold and courageous declaration that I get to need God more. It's like, it's like a superpower there. I mean, God, speaking of superpowers, He does kind of give us a superpower. When we come up against the world, we come up against these things right here. There, there's this promise that He gives us. It's this promise of perfect peace. Now, when I was walking through these seasons, these series of depression and anxiety and stuff, I, I really focused in on this idea of God giving perfect peace because I would look, I would look for it, you know. I, I, it's like I would check the sock drawer. Is it in there? It's not in my pockets. You know, go walking down the road. I can't find it. You know, there. It's not in a store that I can buy it. We think we can buy it. That's called drugs. But it doesn't stick around for a long time. You know, so we're looking, I was looking for this perfect peace. Like where, where is this thing? I want to feel the perfect peace. And I struggled to feel it, which made me think, well, maybe, God's, maybe that's like a promise that doesn't apply to me. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm missing it here. And what I came to realize is this perfect peace that God promises, this superpower, it, it, it's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. 
It's actually something better than that. Feelings and emotions come and go. Let's talk about your marriage. If you're married right now, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're in this room, part of this church, you've never not loved your spouse, right? You've always had the lovey-dovey, you know, feelings in there. But that's not how marriage works because you don't always wake up every day and love the person that's next to you. But love is a choice. If it's based on an emotion, then that marriage is not going to work out. It's based on a choice. You choose every day to love this person, just like you choose every day to say to God, I get to need you more today. And then we can look at this thing, this perfect peace that's not an emotion. So let's look at John 14, uh, verse 27 here. So this is, this is Jesus talking. Jesus is about to ascend up into heaven. And, and the guys are like, well, where are you? you can't leave. Where are you going to go? If you go, what are we going to have? What is it that we're going to get? You know, like, we need you here. You've got to stay with us. And Jesus says to them, he's like, guys, I, I've, I've got to go do this. I mean, like, you know, I died on the cross for you. This, I can't, like, kind of quit now. He's, but I'm going to leave something significant for you. I'm going to leave a helper for you. And he tells them, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to be a gift to you. And it's going to fall on you. And they would have understood the Holy Spirit as something even that, that, that they knew about in what we consider today the Old Testament. Where the Holy Spirit would come and give the power and the ability for a miracle to happen. And then the Holy Spirit would ascend and it would go away. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, but it's never going to leave and then, in fact, it's going gonna, it's gonna to like pray for you. It's going to take your prayers that you don't know how to pray to the throne of God on your behalf. It's going to guide you. It's going to convict you when it wants to steer you in a right way. And it's going to connect you to me. This is Jesus talking here. And that's the gift that he's giving right after he has that conversation. Right after that part. Not days later. It's right after that part. Jesus says... Peace I leave with you. It's not the emotion of peace. It's the Holy Spirit. He just said, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you. And then he says, peace I leave with you. The Holy Spirit I leave with you. My perfect peace I give to you. I leave my Holy Spirit with you. And I give to you my perfect Holy Spirit. I give that to you. Not as the world gives to you. So it's not a gift that you could get from the world. And then he says, don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Don't let yourself be troubled and afraid because I've given you perfect peace. I've given you the Holy Spirit, the helper. I've given you the perfection of my love for you, my guidance for you. Peace is not this emotion. Peace is the Holy Spirit. And then if we look at the expansion of the of the. The text here it says, Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. That's what this promise of peace is. That no matter what happens in your life, no matter how long your list of this is everywhere that I get to need you more, God, and thank you so much for this list, no matter how long that list gets, we have the peace, the Holy Spirit, that God has given us. Now, how do you get the Holy Spirit? You get the Holy Spirit first by just giving your life to Christ, by declaring, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And if you've never done that, well, then you're not going to get this perfect peace that's been given to you. Perfect peace is given to those that choose to follow Jesus. So if you want this perfect peace, we can sort that out. At the end of the service, come down front. We've got prayer partners. We'll pray for you. You don't have to, like, give blood or anything to it. You just got to open up your hands and your heart to God, and boom, you get this. And then we walk with you and help you understand how this works out in your life. You get this perfect peace. You know, here, here's a, a statement that I want to give you, and then we're going to turn it into a prayer in just a second here. Boldness is the courage... Because we've been talking about having bold, courageous prayers. Boldness is the courage to speak up when fear whispers to keep your mouth shut. Boldness is the courage to speak up when fear whispers for you to keep your mouth shut. Now that fear, it has a loud voice in our head. That, 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 uh, that cowardice, the fear, the timidity, all of those things. 
an extremely loud voice. And some of us, it's louder than others. In some seasons, it's loud. Some seasons, it's quiet. But it's a really loud voice. And when you get ready, when you get on the approach to declare a courageous and a bold prayer over your life, when you get your list of everything you're afraid of and you're timid about, and you look at that list and you go down through that list, you can say, all right, God, Praise the Lord, I get to need you more in my finances. Praise the Lord, I get to need you more in my relationship at work with my boss. Praise the Lord that I get to need you more in my broken marriage. Well, hold on a second. Because fear creeps in and says, nah, that one's not going to happen. That one's not going to work. Okay, let me skip that one. Okay. Praise the Lord that I get to need you more in. Now, we don't want to give fear that voice. Instead, we want to be bold, and we want to have the courage to speak up when fear whispers to keep your mouth shut, which means then you look at your list and you have the courage to say, no, 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 I am bold and courageous, and I have the Spirit of God, and I get to need, because I have the helper, I have the Holy Spirit, I have perfect peace promise, I get to need God more, including, for example, in my marriage and in my relationship, and that it will not be broken or imperfect. I'm going to stop that right now. And say, God, thank you that I get to need. Instead of saying, God, why do I have this partner? I'm just using this as one example. Instead of saying, God, why do I have this? Why aren't they better? Why why don't they meet me in the middle? Instead of saying that, you're saying, God, thank you so much that I get to need you in this. And I'm going to boldly and courageously pray for that. I'm going to boldly and courageously pray for them. So let me show you the prayer. This is the prayer you're going to pray every day for two weeks. Karina, thank you. Perfect. She's reading my mind here. So for the next two weeks, you're going to write down everywhere that you're timid, that you're cowardice, everywhere that you're afraid. You're going to write that down. And then every day for the next two weeks, you're going to pray this prayer. We're going to leave it up here so you can take a picture, so you can write it down. You can do something with it. But you're going to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I'll even stand over here so I don't ruin your pictures, okay? Because you don't want to look at me all week every time you want this. Heavenly Father, give me the courage, the boldness to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. Every day you write and you add something to that list, you pray this prayer here. And here's the guarantee that I'll give you. If you pray this prayer every single day for the next two weeks, and God doesn't move in your life, and God doesn't answer some prayers, and God doesn't change you and help you to become a bold and courageous person in Christ then I want you to email. You can email office at southpointchurch.co.za. It comes to my inbox anyway. And say, Pastor Chris, what you said is not true. It didn't work for my life. And I'll meet with you and you can tell me why I'm wrong and why I misspoke and why I led you astray. I can say that with confidence because this isn't a Chris thing. This is a, this is a Jesus thing. I'm not super worried about it. In fact, I would love for people to sit down with me because that just gives me like a one-on-one opportunity with you to just like help you out and love on you and help you to see that this is true. Heavenly Father, give me the courage, the boldness to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let me pray over you. And then we're going to have a worship song and then get you guys out of here. Heavenly Father, I just want to call everybody to hear your voice right now that's in this room or that's watching us online. Lord, I pray that every ear is open, that every heart is open. I pray, Father, that, um, that people would just be able to hear you right now, Lord, right now. God, identify in people things that they need to just accept that they're afraid, they're timid, you know, they're even like a little bit of a cowardice in them. And Father, burn in their spirit, that prayer. Heavenly Father, give me the courage, the boldness to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. Lord, I pray that prayer over everyone in this church and everyone that's watching all week long for the next two weeks. And then I can't wait to see and hear what you've done after that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.